Hello, welcome to Jewish Culture and Jewish Awareness. My name is Dustin Hausner. I'm the Jewish Outreach and Program Director at the Wayne YMCA. Our Jewish programming is funded through the Jewish Federation of Northern New Jersey. Uh, today I have something uh, really enjoyable I get to do, which is talk to someone who I happen to know personally. A number of years ago, uh, we both were part of a leadership program, and through the years we've been able to connect. And I think my friend has, a, you know, not only a very interesting life story, but, you know, what my friend has done with their life and the work that they do, I think is tremendous. I thought it'd be really wonderful to have um, my friend uh, Beatrice on the show and kind of talk about um, her story and talk about what she does now. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll let her obviously share um, her experiences and her thoughts. But um, our guest today is Beatrice Weber. Uh, Beatrice, so great to have you with us today. Yeah, it's great to be here. Um, thank you so much for inviting me. No, it's a great pleasure to have you. So um, I guess for, for those who, um, who are curious, I'll, Beatrice, I'll let you uh, introduce yourself, talk a little bit about yourself. Yeah, okay. So uh, I'm Beatrice Weber. I actually grew up in Canada. I grew up in the ultra-Orthodox community, first in Canada and then in Muncie, Rockland County, and that's where we met. You know, I currently live in Brooklyn. Um, I have 10 children, got married at 18, as is customary, you know, in the community I come from, in an arranged marriage. And um, I, I actually, just to dive into my story before we start talking about the here and now. Please. So I grew up in uh, Canada and in the ultra-Orthodox community later on in Muncie where we met and now currently live in Brooklyn. Um, you know, from a young age, it was very clear. I was taught, told very clearly what I had to do when I would grow up. People sometimes say, oh, what did you want to be when you grew up? And it was like, we ne I never had that opportunity to kind of dream. It was clear. I was the oldest of eight children. I was one of the first grandchildren born from really from four Holocaust survivors and everybody around me, well, they were all Holocaust survivors, everybody's grandparents, you know? So it was clear, like my job was to get married young um, and to have a large family. Um, added to that was, you know, as my parents, um, as I grew up, my parents became um, wealthier and it also became almost like a status symbol in the community or like something accepted that if you were wealthy you were going to marry off your children to somebody that would be a scholar and study for many for many years and, and that's actually what I did it was you know I ended up marrying somebody that um, is, is still studying today and moved to Israel had you know many of my children in Israel and um, you know, six years ago, and it was after a couple of years of having a lot of challenges in my marriage, you know, kind of you get married and you're all idealistic, right? And you're on this big mission. It's not just a mission for you. It's a mission. It's a mission for the community, right? It's a mission to really, a, a, a big part of it is definitely, you know, Holocaust stuff, right? To kind of rebuild the community after the Holocaust. I don't think the next generation, like my, like the 20 year olds, are having that same sense anymore. But definitely, like when I was a kid, you know, in the 70s and 80s, it was very much still, you know, on everybody's mind. Like, we still, like, we have to fix all that. Um, you know, so uh, having, kind of having that as a, as a very strong um, push and, and, and as you have those children, right? And as you support that husband who's learning, you're, you're really fulfilling something bigger than yourself. And I never thought about, you know, what do I want or what do I expect or do I deserve anything? That never, kind of that never came on, on, onto the, onto the radar. It was just about doing what I was supposed to do, you know, and then like all good things at some point, you know, you grow up, right? And you have that moment where it's like, oh my gosh, like, <laughs> like what's going on? <laughs> and that kind of came a little late for me. That came by the time I, I had eight children by then, you know, where I kind of had that moment of like, I don't know, is this how it's supposed to be? You know, I was in my low 30s then, you know, and that's when I, you know, reached out for therapy, reached out for help and kind of started exploring like who I am, what I am, what are my desires, what do I want? And kind of had that really moment of truth that many of us have where, where, you know, we look at our lives and all of a sudden everything switched for me. I had kind of been in this marriage and been in this, um, in this position, really. I played a very important role and, and. All of a sudden, I just saw it differently. It wasn't that, um, you know, this good wife supporting this person who's learning, but really, I don't have a voice here, and I don't have a choice here, and I never really did have a choice. And, you know, then it started like a journey of self-exploration. I went to college, got a job working in a nonprofit, 
which is actually, I think that's when I joined them in Leadership Rockland. That's when we met. You know, I kind of came from that from that organization. We provided services for the people with developmental disabilities and hospitals in Rockland. So that's kind of where I where I came, and and kind of had those few years to really start exploring and hoping that I can kind of find my own within the community and within my marriage. Um, became pretty clear after a couple of years there was no way this was going to work in my marriage. The, the moment I had a voice, and I'm not saying that it's not possible in the ultra orthodox community uh, at all for a woman to have a voice, but it, it, you know it's tough. <laughs> it's tough you have very specific roles to play um, you know and that's I left my marriage um, when I was 40 and really shocked I was really shocked by the amount of opposition that I got from the community from my family from the rabbis I mean right we're Jewish right I was taught like divorce is fine you know <laughs> like we're, the boys are taught you know they, they kind of in the Talmud that the divorce section comes before the marriage section because it's a thing you know but socially it was just so unaccepted by then I had 10 children and it was just just like not an acceptable thing to do and you know that really shocked me and and really um a lot of betrayal and really set me on a path of um, healing and self-discovery and which eventually after several years it kind of moved me away from you know the ultra orthodox way of life i'm still very much connected to judaism and we can talk about that i am an interspiritual minister which played a big role in my kind of going through all the different religions and learning about ritual and at the end of it all being like hmm Judaism is great like there's really a lot to it there's like an awesome combination kind of of the spiritual the mystical the practical the earth-based and all that and and now I'm attending a um you know a Kohena program which is the earth-based Jewish divine feminine which is like just what I need it really is just so healing for me to tap into that because you know, in the ultra orthodox world, it's very patriarchal. I even even outside of it, I know Judaism can be like that, but definitely, you know, I have people at, telling me, "Oh, so you were in the balcony when the men prayed," and I have to say, "No, no, 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 no. There was no balcony for the women. It was a separate room with a tiny little window." You know, I happen to have always enjoyed going to shul, even when I was a little kid, which many um, young girls from the community don't because they're just so separate. But I don't know. I enjoyed the singing. I enjoyed the melody. I enjoyed the community. And now I get to enjoy it in a different way, but still, still having those, you know, Friday night prayers, those, those, those Saturday prayers that are so meaningful to me. So I uh, first of all, appreciate you kind of going through a, a quick version of just your life experiences and obviously your shift from growing up in, um, in your community. And then, you know, now pursuing in uh, different spaces that fulfills your not only spiritual connection, but you're able to give back in your own way, which I think is fantastic. I'm curious, it, growing up, and you were alluding to it a little bit, or at least it seemed like you were, when you were growing up, it's not, you didn't feel necessarily trapped. Like you felt like you were living the way that you were meant to, if that makes sense. In other words, you know, you um, were supposed to have kids, get married. Like, it, it, like this was something you didn't question necessarily till later in life. But when you started going to school or was it something that you know is something usually everyone questions or what what was that environment like so for the most part that's true for the most part for the most part it was just i, I think i think one thing people don't realize is how insular you are hmm. right so you go you know you live in rockland or in brooklyn or wherever and you see this community right so you're kind of walking through right because we're, we're living in the same neighborhood and I, I still live in the neighborhood right so you kind of think like oh okay they're just living here but actually the, the the extent of the insularity is incredible you know i remember as a little kid like you'd go out to the park i'd go out to the park and play and it was you know in, in a neighborhood with all kinds of people and if it would be somebody not from the community and they you know the child would come and want to play we we knew already from that young age it was like you'd run away you know you wouldn't interact at all so there's very very little interaction so there's very little exposure to any other ideas or any other thoughts i definitely did and i'm writing my you know my memoir now so I was, i'm kind of exploring my teenage years so definitely my teenage years i definitely was pushing back a little bit and kind of trying to find myself but again there was no room for that and that, that's when my parents actually moved to Muncie. I was sent to a school in, in, in Northern England at a religious seminary and it was just like shut down. There was no um, space for that exploration. It, it, it's too threatening, I think, for the community. So it's very important that things stay very closed. And, and you probably know maybe about the internet bans that are very strongly enforced in the community. And it, it's so interesting because 
you know, they presented to the community that it's because there are immodest things on the internet and, and all that stuff. And, and I mean, I believe it's about the information, you know, it's scary for a very insular community for people to start accessing all kinds of information and to realize maybe there are other ways of practicing Judaism that are okay. Maybe there's other ways of being, maybe it's okay for a woman to, you know, explore things differently. Um, that's, that's scary and that's threatening. Um, and I didn't have that opportunity at all, you know, so yeah, it was, I was just living the life. And, and I sometimes think, what if my life would have been different? Like, what if I would have been in a really good marriage, right? And things would have gone well, and I would have just continued. May I have not been where I am today, you know, very possibly, yeah. um, very possibly. And sometimes I look at the kind of incredible pressures I dealt with. Yeah. And, you know, I do believe kind of that we're guided to where we're meant to go. And that was probably guiding me to be where I am today, you know, because life would have been different. I may just have continued because, see, there is um, a strong security about being in the community. Mm -hmm. You're very, very, very held um, from like a social standpoint. You, 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 nobody's hungry. Everybody has where to sleep. Um, you're taken care of from, from, from when you're born till you die there's always somebody that's going to pick up the pieces you will never be left alone uh, and, and that's that's very powerful i mean and that's really a beautiful thing um the problem is when it gets used kind of against you when you leave or want to make changes that's kind of held you know withheld sometimes and that gets a little scary it feels it feels like a it feels conditional it is conditional you know it's conditional if you're in the community but it is an extremely strong i mean you may know you go through the community you will not see homeless people you just won't because they're being taken care of um and and that's that's tribute to the community but again you know very conditional for being in the community well it's interesting i mean first of all i think everyone has the the kind of the what if scenarios in your life where it's like you know what if i hadn't met my wife what if i took this job you know it's it's i think it's a very normal thing to be kind of that reflective and try always kind of not a negative way but just kind of wonder what what could have been but what's interesting and we've talked about this offline but um you mentioned it also which i think is interesting is you know you had exposure to people who survived the holocaust and you know one of the things i think most sects of judaism obviously have some sort of relationship you know, with the Holocaust, obviously, of losing, you know, family members, and of course, you know, the horror of it. But it's very, I would almost say it feels like it's very raw in the community you describe of just, like, it's so dominant. And in a way, that's kind of the thing uh, that helps be insular and the idea that, you know, if we don't, something like that could happen again. I'm, I could be misinterpreting it, but that's... Oh. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, I don't want to get too political, but, you know, what's going on now with the wearing a mask, not wearing the mask, and the, the level of compliance with the COVID regulations. I think people don't realize the extent to which um, there's a constant fear in the community of being attacked. Mm -hmm. That is just the way it is. You know, when I went to, and I used the court system, right, when I left my marriage, and, you, you know, used the resources available for people who live in the United States, that was very scary. Like, I saw the way my parents reacted. It was clear that to them, you don't go to those people for help. You know, like, those people are considered the possibility of kind of um, rising up against you. You know, when, and when I left my marriage, I, I got emails from anonymous people. I still don't know who they are. You know, I have my suspicions, but I don't know. And there were there are long paragraphs about, you know, your grandparents survived that. This is what they survived the Holocaust for, to see their grandchild doing this and that. So there's a lot of it used. There's also, um, you know, guilt. Um, it's like trauma, like un really unprocessed trauma, right? So there's a lot of a sense of like, we did something to deserve it, or the Jewish nation as a whole did something to deserve this. And we need to constantly be fixing it. We need to constantly be fixing it. So yeah, the Holocaust has a very, um, like a really strong backdrop in terms of the decisions and choices that people make in the community, for sure. I mean, to your point, and again, I, I certainly want to move, move on, but you know, you mentioned obviously your kids and kind of their connection or lack of to an extent with the Holocaust. And I think of, um, you know, I have a little girl who's, um, you know, not even two yet. And like before she was born, when my wife was pregnant, we went to um, a ceremony honoring Alan Moskin. For those who watched the series, he's actually was a guest on one of our episodes. 
and he was a liberator and he talked about you know in graphic detail about his story it was an all-adult room and i had tears in my eyes because in my mind my daughter was hearing a liberator mm -hmm. and when she's old enough to actually hear these stories there's a good chance there's not gonna be anyone left and it's a very just I think it's a very fascinating, and I don't say fascinating in a good way, but fascinating just in a really thought-provoking way of what are the future generations going to absorb, what are they not going to absorb, and how is it going to impact? Because, you know, we've been blessed enough to have met survivors and to know it's true and to know, you know, the impact, whereas it's 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 going to be a very big question for upcoming generations, and it's it's hard. See, but... In contrast, I, I do a little, in contrast, in the community, yeah. the ultra orthodox community, first of all, the word Holocaust was never used. Mm -hmm. Shoah, right. definitely not. You didn't, you didn't observe Yom HaShoah, right? The Holocaust Remembrance Day was not observed. Mm -hmm. um, I was not allowed to read Holocaust books when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. Like it was too scary and too big. It was too. It was like right there in your living room. Mm -hmm. It was not something. It. It, it, they 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 couldn't do that. Like they couldn't study it. They couldn't look at it. It was they were just like I saw. You know, I mean, I I, I didn't. I heard that before my grandfather passed away. He'd be screaming all night. You know, it was real for them. So real that they were not able to do that. And it almost became like a secular thing to do that to do those things. You know, not a not a something that it's not something we do. I was never taken. To a Holocaust museum or anything like that, you know, it was not. Yeah, it was not a thing. So just interesting the, the perspectives, and it doesn't mean that they're less impacted. On the contrary, it's because oh, it's so seeped yeah. in. You know, like I work worked in a clinic for a few years in the community, and we knew there were several years where there was just nobody born in those years that that were there. You know, because they just weren't. There were no babies born. You know, in the forties, like we just wouldn't have any patients in the clinic right we'd have them starting again in the late 40s and maybe a some before but there was that chunk of years where there was just nobody born in the community so it was just so yeah you know when there's a trauma that's so like seeped in that people aren't even talking about it because it's so i know and, and in me i mean my grandfather would walk out of the room the second anybody made any reference to anything related to the holocaust you know his trauma of losing his wife and two children was just too big he was not but that's but that's even just the thing is a lot of people didn't talk about it for decades until like movie star and just other things and i would say to you when it comes to grief and trauma i, I would say we're still at the infancy of some yeah. of these things of how to respond how to deal with it how to have these conversations because it's not something you you're taught or you talk about or even just a few decades ago was something you just didn't do yeah. but it's um no it's again I, i'm not yeah, yeah. so um, I would like to switch gears a little bit because uh, I uh, we could certainly talk offline about this, but uh, I think there's other interesting things I want to discuss about you. So I'm, I'm curious when you you know went to school when you started learning, and what eventually kind of led to the Eureka moment of needing to make a life change. Was there specific influences that impacted you, or was it something that was more of a general learning of different things, seeing the world, and just really feeling like you needed to do more like what was there something that led to that point where you want to make the the major life change yeah i mean for me it was really well i guess it went in two stages you know my first um was a very strong anger when i i felt was a lot of betrayal from you know rabbis that i had been very close to and um i trusted and i actually just had to read over some of the paperwork and i'm like oh my gosh, like, I can't believe they did this. Like, it really is, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the need. And, and what I realize now is that I don't think I realized then um, that a woman at my stage with 10 children that was married to a rabbi was able to come and say, I'm in a bad marriage and I'm not putting up with this anymore and I'm going to leave. is mm -hmm. very, very threatening for the community. Like, they don't want women doing that and and as in every community there are bad marriages right and you know I don't, I don't think it's necessarily more common than in other places but as a very insular close community the idea that a well-respected woman well-respected family can have that happening 
was too, too threatening for them. And, you know, when I was in it, I don't think I realized, um, I, I don't think I had that perspective, which I have now looking back and saying, oh, of course they did that. Of course they did everything to try to, um, uh, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to go into everything that was done to me, but basically to, to um, make me out to be that there's something really, really wrong with me. And, you know, again, try to take away the children, all, all of that. But it really like understanding now, of course, it was, you know, hurtful to me and impacted me greatly, even though, you know, we live in New York state. So we went to family court and every, you know, it was fine. But um, it was more about just shutting down the idea that a woman can do this in the kingdom. Mm -hmm. You know, if you, if you want to do this, like, the message was, to me and to, really to everybody else, like you can try this, but this is the price you're going to have to pay because I was very much in the community at that point. Like there was, you know, I dressed as if I was in the community. I believe that, and my intent was to be in the community. I had no intent. And people are like, oh, you left a net, you left a marriage, you know, to leave the community. Not at all. Like that was not, not my intent at all. Um, but, but the betrayal, because as a woman, you, I wasn't really exposed um, to how things work on the communal level. You know, it was, it was about me taking care of my children, taking care of my husband, even though I was kind of this Revitson, right? Because he, you know, he got this job. So I was, it was still very much an at home taking care of things rather than in being involved in the communal level. I was pretty, I was pretty shocked and very angry. So that was kind of my first um, sense of like, I, I can't live like this anymore. You know, and that was a lot of anger. Um, there was a lot of anger there. But then I, you know, after about a couple of months said maybe I can figure out like a middle way, still staying in the Orthodox community and kind of figuring out a way how to make it work. And I did that for about two years. And during that time, I, I really was doing a lot of pretty intense healing work. There was a lot to, lot to heal from, you know, on the generational level, as we discussed, but also on a personal level, you know, there was a lot to heal from. And and through that healing really just came to a very clear realization that, you know, the way ultra orthodoxy presents Judaism as being very black and white and very harsh, you know, and I don't know, lately I've been hearing, you know, that Jewish people don't believe in, in, you know, the world to come or hell. I don't know. We were raised with hell. I don't know. <laughs> that was part of my, my definitely part of my um, um, education in regards to Judaism, you know, the idea of a punitive God, the idea, you know, even now with, with COVID, I mean, how, there were signs that women need to dress more modestly or men should not be talking during prayers. Like there's a real um, concept that bad, bad things happen to you it's because you angered God. And it, it came to a point where I, I just, I couldn't, I couldn't live like that anymore. I'm like, I, my, my, the, the, I was really doing a lot of spiritual healing as well. And my connection to, you know, something greater than me, to, to, to the divine, as I like to call it, or, you know, just did not mesh with that belief system, that belief system anymore. And, and I think, you know, a lot of the practices are beautiful, you know, and I, and I, I do a lot of the practices. And I think back to many of the practices that were so ingrained, you know, waking up early in the morning, washing your hands, mm -hmm. welcoming the soul, right? And thanking God for a new day. Those are all beautiful, beautiful practices. But, you know, it was um, taught in a very um, punitive, demanding way that became very exacting and just was not, just didn't fit my worldview anymore. So I'm curious because it's been very interesting that there are plenty of people who grow up with a certain belief system and then because of just different experiences then completely want to do a 180. They want to go in a completely different direction. But what's been interesting is um, in, like yourself, people who you know leave, are part of programs like Footsteps and others, you still want to be involved in Judaism. You still want to have a Jewish values, identities, and way of being. And I'm curious, it, what is it, what part, why, I guess what with Judaism makes you want to stay? Is it just very positive good memories? Is it certain types of lessons? Because obviously there's many different sects of Judaism. There's many different belief systems, even within Judaism, just as there is in Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, and many of the other religions. So I'm curious, what makes you want to stay with your Jewish identity and, you know, evolve with that? Because obviously, as you were mentioning, you're doing work now at the, um, you know, well, I'll let you talk about your work in a, in a few moments, but I'm curious, what makes you want to still have that connection? Yeah, so uh, I think I mentioned that I'm an interspiritual interfaith minister. So, you know, I kind of got that or ordination in June of 2020. 
Um, so it was a two, it was a two year program where I had an opportunity to explore, you know, all the types of religions and, and then the next year ritual. And when I went into that program, I knew like part of my intention was I wanted to heal from the incredible kind of betrayal and anger I had against Judaism. It was like, I, I was like, I can't, I can't, I can't live like this. You know, so it felt like going into a program where we would be exploring all religions from kind of an interspiritual perspective felt like it would be really good. And, you know, was, so our first year was really focused on, on all different religions. And I remember that the week we did Judaism, it was really hard for me to attend in person. I attended online that day. We always had that option because it was a lot for me, you know, and, and obviously the week they taught Christianity, most of the, most of the class were, came from Christian backgrounds. They were all freaking out. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this sounds nice. You know, so <laughs> it's, all, it's all about, you know, where we come from and, and you know, our, our, our perspectives. But, you know, definitely having that experience of being a Exposed to all different kinds of religions, kind of finding finding a lot of the good in Judaism, and and finding um, how so many of the practices that are so revered in other places are actually something that's integrated as part of Judaism. I, I just felt that Judaism had such a good balance between you know, practice, but also you know spiritual meaning, like meaning to the things we do, um, but yet very earth based and and. It just felt to me to be such a um, something powerful about it, and yes, you know, I do have some good. I do have nice memories. You know, I'll never, I'll never forget being eight years old and we went to bless the sun. That was probably before you were born, but you know, every twenty-eight years, right? You kind of do that when the sun circles. Like, like there are these memories that are that are powerful, you know, and there are these practices that that remain powerful, and I'm grateful um, to now be able to participate in them from a place of connection from a place of um feeling you know the meaning it has i mean i pray almost every day i, I do use a, a talus now i didn't grow up using a talus obviously right because women don't have that but for me the the symbolism and the feeling of wrapping yourself in something that symbolizes a remembrance of your connection to something greater than yourself you know i look at it just as kind of people spread all over and we're kind of bringing us all together as one that's meaningful to me well, I'm curious when it comes to um, intro, um, intro spiritual, um, which I believe was the terminology, if I said that uh, incorrectly, please correct me. Like, obviously, I've heard the term interfaith many times, and it's usually when different religions kind of come together for a common cause or common purpose. But um, intro spiritual, is it, um, I guess your practice is it kind of a fusion of different types of belief systems? Is it one singular idea, but different things? Like, can you kind of explain a little bit more what does it mean to be an, a minister? In, uh... Yeah, so the idea of being an interspiritual minister is that, uh, is the deep belief that there are many ways of connecting with the divine and mm -hmm. they're all okay, you know, and they're, and, they're all, and they're all okay. It's just, we're all, it's the idea that there are many paths to the river. And it's all about which path do we choose to walk on. So do you, when you're ministering, is it that you're um, speaking to specific people who are, who are looking for something? Or is it something like, I guess, who is it that you're uh, speaking to? Like if, if someone found your title and wanted to know more, like what to do, what you do or how you help or how you, you know, what would be that thing? Yeah, so I'm definitely more, in my personal practice is Judaism, right? So, so I definitely come from a Jewish perspective, but have the ability to kind of see other perspectives, know about the other religions, and how to integrate. So for instance, you know, a marriage, right? Officiating, officiating at it. At a wedding, which are all, I think, still on Zoom right now. But, you know, so, so when you're, you're an interspiritual minister, you kind of have the background and the sensitivity and the understanding of how can you create that wedding ceremony in a way that everybody's voice is there, that everybody feels heard, that you can put all those pieces together. Or if it's a, a baby blessing, right? Like, how can we incorporate part of the Jewish tradition? But yet, if there are members of the family from another tradition, how can we incorporate that as well and kind of bring that all together? And the idea is... Like we were raised that that's there's, it's impossible, right? But when you come from an interspiritual perspective, that's actually welcome because there are those are all paths to one to one. Uh, I have to laugh for five seconds because once we started talking about inner spiritual, the light beam from my office started to come down. So oh really, oh someone likes what we're talking about. So <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I'm a bad joke. But um, I, I'm curious in regards to you were talking about your program that you're involved with now that has to do with 
um, feminism, but also like very earth-based Judaism. And like this past year, which I'm excited to celebrate next year, um, I really got to do a Tuba Shvat Seder for the first time. And it was one of, it's something that I'm kicking myself because I just, I loved it. Everything about it, of having the Seder, of honoring the different plants to, you know, having the community feel. And, you know, when you look at, um, you know, not even just like Shabbat, but, you know, Sukkot and many, there's a lot of holidays that have a clear, deep connection to the earth when it comes to Judaism. So I'm curious, is it an exploration on that side of it or what, what in the program that you're taking now, what about Judaism and the earth is the, is the thing you're, you're learning about or working on? Yeah, so I'm way at the beginning. It's a seven-year program, and I just started in August. So <laughs> let me be really honest about that. And, and it's a lot for me, you know, because it's really about um, shifting a lot of the beliefs of how I was raised. Um, and some of the concepts are pretty powerful. What, one of the work I'm doing on a personal level is, you know, my Hebrew name that I haven't used for a little bit, but is the name I was named, you know, and is important to me. It's, it's how can I explore that? My name is, my name is Bacheva, right? Which was, you know, King Solomon's mother. And, and there's a whole story around that, right? Um, she was married to another man, you know, in, in the Psalms is a whole forgiveness um, Psalm about that. So there's, a, there's always been this, um, I don't know, this uncomfortability with that name, right? Like, is it a name that I can fully embody and sit in if there's so much guilt and shame associated with it? So one of the things I'm doing now is exploring that. Are there different perspectives than, when, than the traditional ways that I was taught? You know, so that on a personal level, that's, that's what, what I'm going through. You know, again, we learn about prayer, but prayer becomes more about, there's a lot of chanting, a lot of drumming, a lot of connecting with the now, a lot of slowing down, a lot of pacing, a lot of that, um, and really getting to the core of what, I mean, Judaism uh, 2,000 years ago was definitely nothing like what any of us are practicing, whether it is the ultra-Orthodox or anybody, like nothing at all like that. So to me, it feels like kind of going back to that and going back to those sources. But there's also kind of the ability to make it our own and create our own. And it's about like where it's coming from and, and um, and, and, and for me personally, uh, we use the um, feminine, um, you know, Hebrew, Hebrew is a language, right, of a gendered language. So we use the feminine a lot, which again, for me is incredibly healing and incredibly a beautiful way of seeing it because, I mean, we all know there's no gender, right? In, in, in spirit, it's not, it's not gendered, but for whatever reason, it has become gendered. And especially, you know, because of my experiences, that, that's challenging for me. But when I can kind of shift that, it, it becomes very different. But yeah, I mean, but what's interesting, and here I'll go back to the ultra-Orthodox or Hasidic community, they've celebrated seders for you, for ever, you know? So they, they have done these, these things. It's just has become very rigid, you know, and has become very rules and very controlling. But at its source, you know, Hasidim are the ones that really captured that part of Judaism. It's interesting because I think depending on what you're looking for, I think it's always surprising when you grow up in a certain prayer environment and then go somewhere that's different. I know for for me, it was very much, it felt very serious. And then I went to a shul where it was like music and laughter and, you know, just this very celebratory, you know, like, let's thank God, like really like, you know, from the rooftops. And I know for some Jews, that's almost like blasphemous to go to a place like that. But for me, it was just to, to hear a side of Judaism like that existing was just fascinating to me. And I think it's, I think it's very interesting when you look at different religious interpretations and views, because, you know, even one of our most famous texts, the Talmud, is literally arguments and debates about Judaism. It's, you know, I think it's, I think there's something magnificent about that, not something that should be a hindrance, but uh, I'll get off my high horse uh, for a minute here. And uh, I, I do want to ask you about the book you're working on, um, which yeah. is interesting. So, so is it, is it just, a, is it a mainly an autobiography? Are you hoping to talk about specific issues in it? Uh, tell us about the book. Yeah. So it's a memoir and the theme, the th so, which is not an autobiography. It's not going to be my whole, my whole life story, it's, it, but it's theme. You know, when, when you write memoir, it's like your, your story, but with a theme. And the theme is really what I talk about a lot now. And I'm actually offering a course that I'd love to talk about soon, yeah. in two weeks time, um, 
and it's about finding my voice, you know, and it's about like how, like what happened. And as I write it, it's interesting that memories come up, you know, that were kind of buried. And it's like, what does it mean to come from a space um, where one had no voice, you know, and no encouraging, like no voice, and then kind of develop and grow into that and live that. And, you know, like one of the things we did in the interest in, as part of my interspiritual ministry process was take a stand for something. And for me, it was using my voice, you know, using my voice. So that's really the, the message throughout. It's like, what does it mean to come from a space, a, a community or a background where having your own voice was so strongly discouraged and pushed down? And like, how do, how do, you, how do you get to the point where, yes, you can use that voice, you can speak up for things that are really important? Let me ask, because I know, um, obviously, you're doing this um, interview right now, so you've talked about your story on, on this. You've had, um, I know, times where you've been, like, on panels, and you've spoken about your story publicly on a number of occasions, and you write about it. Um, you, you've written about it before. I'm curious, what has made you want to continue to tell this very significant, but I would say also, in many ways, painful parts of your life because we also know that um obviously these days i feel like there's a lot of documentaries and films that like um unorthodox and other things that try and you know talk about not your exact experience but the things that relate to your experience and you know the both the positive and the negative pushback on these type of things so i'm, I'm curious what has made you want to continue to tell your story and also do you feel that the more exposure uh, what impact that has had yeah, so it's interesting, like in 2016, so this goes back four years ago, I just just felt inspired that it, it was an important thing for me to do. And you know, sometimes we get these thoughts in our head that don't, right, we get a lot of thoughts in our heads all the time, but sometimes we get these thoughts that just don't leave us. Yeah. So this is something that's kind of been on my heart for for years, you know, and I, and I, and I did my first piece of writing that I put out that was personal and that was important was in March, mm. um, you know, of this year. I think the message, it's a very personal story, but yet it's a very universal message, you know, the universal message. And I keep on getting feedback from people whenever I put a piece of writing out there of how touched they are and how it has affected them personally, how they, they may be making different choices because of what they've heard me say. You know, I feel like the power of storytelling is so strong because it's so resonant and so connecting because we all have a story. And when we hear someone else's story, we can shift and make those choices for ourselves. Um, that, that's what I can say. And trust me, the question you're asking me, I ask myself that many, many times. <laughs> like, <laughs> so, yeah. No, but it, it's a powerful, no, no, you were about to say something, I'm sorry. Yeah, and I, and I think also it, it is a painful story, but if I can use my pain, the pain is the pain, like it happened, you know, <laughs> and still happens not over you know it's still something a lived experience but if i can use that in a way that helps other people it helps me you know it helps me feel like it's not futile it's not for nothing there is a purpose to all of this um and that's that's just ex extraordinary healing for me as well so for anyone out there who is interested in you know the programs that you're the the series you're going to start in a few weeks or to read your writings or to kind of you know learn about the book or anything else where's the best place for people to uh, to find you yeah so i have a website which is my name so you can see my name beatriceweber.com that was still available so i got that <laughs> so you can find me there i'm also on facebook a lot so you can message me on facebook as well and my email is beatrice at beatriceweber.com so those are the three places i do write on medium so if any your um, listeners are medium readers. That's a good place to go because I have my article there. You'll search my name, you'll find me there. And yeah, I'm on other social media as well, but that's enough for you to find me. Yeah, and in two weeks, I'm really excited. So I'm actually, I'm giving a four day um, course, a free course on um, connect, connect with your inner voice and rewrite your story. You know, I'm a strong believer in, as you can probably figure, of not ignoring your story, you know, in, on, the, on the contrary, really embracing your story, embracing your past, but, and using that to kind of move ahead to where you want to go. And it's only by being able to embrace that, that you can kind of break through the blocks and move ahead. So yeah, I'm offering that, which I'm really excited. I gave it back in June. So now I'm offering it again. So that's coming up. And I, I don't know when this, oh, one second, when, when will you be 
will this go out before that? I don't know. Uh, but, it should be out around the time. So okay, it's right. it really so nice. Just hop, on, just hop on, let me know you're interested and we will get you right into that course. Nice. So I will, uh, I'll make sure we'll have the link in the email when we're, you know, leading up to the end to make sure that there's, you know, that goes in. So um, I guess the, the last thing I do want to ask is, you know, you, one of the things that impresses me greatly is obviously you've done a lot in your, in your life so far. And um, while yes, I do look very young. Thank you very much. I'm actually um, a little old, older than I was talked about, but you know, you, have changed your life in a very powerful, dramatic way. And you, in many ways, are finding peace through that. And I feel like one of the things that gets brought up all the time, or at least from people that I know, is, you know, afraid to make changes like that. Mm -hmm. That, you know, whether it's out of necessity or whether it's, you know, just this, you know, fear of, you know, going out and not having the safety net of either your community or your family. You know, what you did was incredibly, took a lot of strength and a lot of bravery. You know, not everyone could do that. And I'm curious for anyone out there who's not in the same situation, but someone who wants that change or is scared to make that change, you know, what advice or what words of wisdom or experience uh, would you offer? Yeah, I mean, to me, it's really trust yourself. Take the time to listen yourself you know we spent so much time listening to others getting advice from others no I did a lot of that for years and it was told I was willing and able to just sit quietly and listen to it deep down because we I believe that we all hold our truth deep inside of us and if we're willing to slow down and listen we're going to know what the next right thing is to do we're, we're going to know what, what, what's what's the next right thing and yes it's, Sometimes we make choices that um, come at a really high price. There's no, there's no question about that. Um, but for me, living a life that's self-determined, where I get to make choices, you know, is worth everything. And that's what I can tell people that are afraid of the repercussions. Just know that living a life where you get to make choices, where you get to live your truth is extraordinary and empowering and it gets you past all of those challenges well beatrice i of course want to thank you very much for making the time uh, to be interviewed today and I'm, I'm grateful that after these many years we've stayed in touch um I'm, I'm really happy and proud to call you a friend and for anyone out there uh, please check out the website if you want to know what uh, beatrice is doing and uh, about the course series and all these other great things that um, she's working on and I just want to wish everyone uh, good health, good safety, and uh, just once again, Beatrice, just thank you so much for joining us today. Okay, thank you.